So it's a pleasure to be here uh, to talk about Stuart and to talk about some work that we did together. Uh, the title that I picked, Do Actions Exist, is actually the title of the first paper that I wrote, and in fact, the only paper that I wrote was Stuart. Interesting enough, Stuart was the first real experimentalist that I'd worked with. And it was a complete discovery. Of course, Mel Schwartz was also a real experimentalist, but Mel was in a different category. <laughs> and uh, we wrote this paper. We were both uh, assist young assistant professors at Stanford. And I may be the first Italian he started arguing with. <laughs> uh, and what I would like to tell you is a little bit about this story. The most amazing part about the story, we still are asking the same question. Do actions exist 36 years later? And in a way, because Stuart was interested in fundamental physics, this is a very good, good, good story to, to, to talk about. Uh, the axiom was to first appeared in connection to a problem in QCD uh, because uh, of the vacuum state of QCD being so complex. There's an extra term in the Lagrangian of QCD which actually violates P. Uh, and, and, and T, but conserves C, and therefore it can produce a neutron dipole moment. Uh, and the, you can calculate when this neutral dipole moment is proportional to its parameter theta. And uh, because there's such a strong bound of a neutron electric dipole moment, it requires this angle theta to be very small, to be something like 10 to the minus 10. That's unnatural. So you ask, what, what makes it that? Well, it turned out that at that time, Helen Quinn and I figured out a solution that in the standard model, if you added an extra symmetry, this, uh, this, an extra global chiral U1 symmetry, which now is called U1PQ, uh, then, in fact, there is a solution to this problem. You can rotate this, this, this theta parameter to zero. And uh, what is amazing is this is still the only viable solution 36 years later to, to, to this problem. And, uh, what was pointed out soon after we wrote our paper by Weinberg and by Wilczek was that this symmetry, because it's spontaneously broken, always has a Goldstone boson, not quite a Goldstone boson, but it has a very light scalar, and that's the axiom. And so if you want to prove that this is actually the way things work, you at some point have to find axioms, and axioms are pretty good at nothing. So in a way, that's what that, that was the right thing to do. So what happens in, in, in physically is that instead of having a st static interaction theta times, times this gluon density, you now have an axion field that interacts with a gluon density. That is CP conserving, uh, but uh, you do have to have an axion. And everything in axion theory depends on the scale FA, which is the scale of a symmetry breaking, and uh, all parameters essentially scale with the, with, the, with the scale of a symmetry breaking. So if you go through and do a little bit of a theory, the scale of a breaking, uh, this F, is ubiquitous. It actually appears in every interaction. Everything is proportional to 1 over F. And in our case, in, 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 in our paper, we assume, which was very natural at that point, that that scale was the same as the weak interaction scale, about 250 GeV. And, uh, we wrote this paper very carefully. Actually, Stuart wrote quite a bit of a paper. And then uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a sentence from the paper, which I'm sure came from, from, from Stuart, because he didn't believe a word that, we, that these things really existed. But uh, our conclusion regarding the existence of the sparkle are somewhat pessimistic. And I will give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the things that we looked at, because uh, we wouldn't have looked at all of these experiments if it wasn't for Stewart. One of the experiments that, 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 that we looked at was an old experiment of Rhinus doing, doing uh, neutrino scattering. And uh, axions would, would be produced by a reactor and would eventually decay. And so you would have some excess of photons. And we estimated a number of photons that we would expect in Rhinus experiment. And uh, we would expect something like 7,000 photons if the mass of the action was about 100 uh, keV. And uh, Rhinus had a background of photons, which was something like 160 plus or minus 260. So that clearly told you that actions couldn't be very much heavier because this, this scales like the mass of the action to the six. Then part of a reason Mel Schwartz was in this experiment, because he was looking for melons, 
Uh, he was looking for any kind of strange radiation coming out of slack in the beam, beam dump. And it turns out that you could actually bremsstrahl long axions in the beam dump. They would eventually uh, pair produce muons, and that would give us a, a, a signal. And uh, we, 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 there was no signal for, for these muons, and that gave us a bound on some of the parameters of the axion. But the part that was very interesting to me, because I didn't know the story of Rhinus and, and, and Fermi, was that in fact, one of the, we, we, in this paper, we also discussed other experiments that you could search for axions, and we suggested indeed that uh, you could look for axions in a nuclear explosion, and you would get photons that will be prompt, and you will see the photons, and then the neutrons will come. And again, I think that we included this whole section, and I was too naive at that point to understand what was in Stuart's mind, because you wanted to, 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 to write this phrase, needless to say, this would be a one-shot experiment. <laughs> and I think the whole section on, 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 on trying to look for actions with nuclear explosions, so we were brave enough to, to use nuclear explosion, and the referee did not veto this. Anyway. It turns out that uh, weak scale actions, actions that have a, a scale of a weak interactions, are actually ruled out by experiments, for example, in K on decay. Uh, there's a bound on, on K onto pi plus action, which, is, uh, which experiments at K K are, are way below that. So you know that there are no weak scale actions. Although we almost ruled them out in our paper, they eventually were ruled out, for example, by this kind of thing. Now, the interesting thing, and what we not, did not expect uh, at the time, is that the choice that the scale of the action is the same as the weak interaction is not necessary. In fact, you could make the scale of the action much larger than the weak interaction. And if you do that, then uh, you, 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 your actions have become very light because everything is scale like one over f. They become very long lived and very weakly coupled. And so they become invisible. They still solve the problem, but in, in principle, they are really getting to be nothing. And, and, and there are various models uh, that, that, that gives you the, the, this, these actions. I'm not going to enter into that. But, but the important point that uh, you can make models in which the scale that is associated with the action is a very large scale. And uh, then you, you, you solve the problem, but you have these very light excitations in the theory. Now, what is interesting is that essentially there is no free, free parameters in this theory. The mass of the action is inversely proportional to the scale. And, and so you know that if a scale is 10 to a 6 GV, then the axial mass is about 6 electron volts, and it scales like 1 over f. Now, these Invisible action models, what makes them interesting is that they're not totally invisible. They're actually uh, accelerators. Uh, astrophysics gives bound on the, mass of, on the mass of the axion because there's a coupling of axions to two photons, and uh, stars will lose uh, energy by this process in which photons in the star would, would transform into axions, which then leave the star. And, uh, you can put a bound on, on, on the mass of the axion or on the scale 1 over f. If 1 over f, if, if f is very large, then eventually this, these, these, uh, they do not affect stellar evolution, and so that's why you get an upper bound for the mass of the axion. Now, what is more interesting physically is that you not only have an upper bound for the mass of the action, but you also have a lower bound for the mass of the action or an upper bound for the scale 1 over fa, and that's what makes axions very interesting as, as a particle. Because remarkably, cosmology gives a, a, a lower bound for the axial mass or, or, or an upper bound for the scale of, of interaction. And the physics is simple to understand. In very early in the universe, uh, when temperatures are of the order of the scale Fa, uh, QCD is not effective, and so essentially the action angle can be any, any number. It eventually, when you get down to in the temperature and get temperatures of the order of QCD scale, then uh, the angle that is associated with the action or the action uh, field uh, eventually gets driven to zero. And uh, it gets driven to zero in an oscillatory manner, and these 
zero, zero, uh, zero momentum oscillations of reactions contribute to the universe energy density. And so you can calculate how much is the contribution of the axis to the universe energy density, and that gives you a bound. If Fa is too big, uh, you get too, too, much, too much energy density in axioms. So you can actually do a calculation, and uh, you can calculate the, the, the density of dark matter in the universe, and you see that it's proportional to this, this parameter F, and, it, and, and that density gets to be too big if, if F is, 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 is too large, Theta here is a misalignment angle. It's sort of the angle that, that the theta parameter of the axiom field takes early, early in the universe phase transition. And so if theta is of order one, then you can get a bound on F or, a, or a, an upper bound on F or a lower bound of the mass of the action. So if actions have masses which are of the order of uh, 20 micron electron volts, uh, you would then uh, they, they will be the, the, the dark matter in the universe. So suddenly this, ex this excitation becomes very interesting as one possible candidate for, for dark matter. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about, since, since Stewart's an experimentalist, I felt that I had to do my, my duty to try to talk a little bit about experiments. And one of the things that is particularly interesting is 36 years after this paper, people are still looking for actions and in fact are doing so in, in, with incredibly nice, nice experiments. So there are experiments that probe both the cosmological uh, uh, actions and actions that would have astrophysical implications. On the astrophysical side, uh, there's a large collaboration at CERN that looks for action produced in the sun and through, uh, through uh, the two photon coupling, the fact that an axion can uh, a photon can transform itself into an action in, in, in the sun, and then you can, and then you can try to detect these axions by again transmuting them in a big magnetic field in, into, into an, into an X-ray photon. This is, a, uh, this is a type of experiment that Pierre Sikivi pioneered the theory for it. So the experiment is very simple. Uh, photons in the sun, because of the Primakov process, produce axions, and then axions are transmitted in, uh, are, are transmuted. That's the word that Stuart would have liked, like, transmuted. Uh, it's easy for me because it's somewhat Italian, but anyway. Uh, axions then would, would, would hit this magnet. The magnet provides one of the photons and then transforms itself into X-ray photons. And everything here is known. It all depends on the scale of a coupling of two photons to the axion, and you have a well-defined solar flux, and so you can actually try to look for these axions, and what you have like, uh, uh, is, uh, are bounds in which, most interesting, you're beginning to actually look into a, this, this yellow band here is the, is the area of parameter space where axion models will tell you that you are, and CAST is beginning to probe the axion window at the level of the astrophysical bound, it doesn't quite get to, to one electron volt, but it eventually uh, will, will, will get there. And more, more interesting is that there's another larger proposed experiment that will do much better than what CAS has done up to now. This uh, experiment called IAXO will actually uh, improve this, the, 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 these bounds to the level of about uh, uh, in, in the level of 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus one uh, masses of the action. So it's a, it's a, if indeed this experiment can actually be done, is improvement in the signal by almost a factor of a million. So again, this is a, really looking for actions coming from astrophysical processes. Now these actions do not have a large enough, uh, a small enough mass to actually be the dark matter of the universe, but still could be there, and it is, it, it, it is a very nice nothing to look for. More interesting, perhaps, is actions that are actually even lighter, that would, that they would contribute to the, to the dark matter of the universe, and there, there is a tremendously uh, interesting uh, uh, experiment called ADMX, this experiment, again, uses essentially the same idea 
of the Sekivi in which you take a magnetic field to transform an axion into a photon. In this case, you look at a resonant cavity, and uh, if you uh, if this misalignment angle is of order one, you expect axions of order 10, 10, 10 microelectron volt. And the ADMX experiments essentially prove, uh, probes this, 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 this area. They have now bounds on, on axions of masses of, of, of a few microelectron volt. They use a very large cavity and a very large uh, magnet. So the cavity, the, the cavity is about four meters long and there's a, a eight Tesla magnet, and they are they're looking for, for axions that transmute it into, into a resonant photon in, in the cavity. So here is what ADMX has seen up to now. Uh, there is these, you, you see that they are beginning to pro probe this yellow band where the axion model uh, are come in, but more importantly, uh, this is what their data has been for the last 10 years. The proposed uh, continuation of this experiment will actually cover entirely the, the yellow ba band around uh, 10 microelectron volts. And so in that sense, it will be able to, uh, to, to probe axions if they are the dark matter of the universe. Now, I want to end uh, by talking a little bit about recent development, because this is, again, looking for nothing with, with real vengeance. Uh, the, the area in axial mass that ADMX probes is an area where axions would be the, the dark matter in the universe if, indeed, the misalignment angle was of order one. But we don't really know that the misalignment angle is of order one. Uh, it, it is much more natural for this parameter f in general to be of order of, a, of a, the, the gut scale or perhaps to be of the order of a Planck scale. In that case, the axial mass is very, is, is, is very, is very light, and so ADMX wouldn't see it. So you get, you're getting to really looking for, 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 next, for, for nothing. And there has been a very recent, uh, very nice suggestion by Graham uh, and Rajendran that actually tell you how to search for actions that are super light and, and, uh, in, and, and they could be the dark matter of the universe. And this is a lovely idea and one that I think Stuart would have really loved. Uh, remember I told you that the theta parameter gave you a dipole moment of, uh, uh, for, for the neutron. Uh, if the theta parameter is replaced by an axiom field, then the dipole moment of a neutron uh, is proportional to the action field. And if this action field is sloshing in being uh, the dark matter in the universe, you should see that the dipole moment of a neutron actually is oscillating with, a, with the frequency of the action mass. Now, the most interesting point that Graham and Rajendran made is that actually all of these coefficients in front of a, uh, of a dipole moment are actually dependent on the ratio of the action uh, strength to, to FA, and that ratio is basically set by the dark matter of the universe. It is basically something that can be computed directly if you say that actions are the dark matter of the universe. It is a very small parameter of order 10 to the minus 19, but it tells you that the neutron dipole moment is very small, of order 10 to the minus 3, I even see Gene's eyes so open up but it oscillates, and it oscillates with the mass of the action. So indeed, the idea is, could you find this very small dipole moment uh, oscillating at the frequency of the axial mass? Now, the answer is that this, this is an enormous small number, and therefore the static part of it you certainly cannot see, but maybe you can follow this, the, this, the, this oscillations, and indeed, uh, Graham and Rajendran suggested using call molecules to actually try to trace this oscillatory parameter. More, more recently, Booker and friends suggest looking for, for basically the precession of trying to, to amplify this, this thing by using NMR techniques. And remarkably, uh, in the next slide, I'll show you a graph where that little, that 
the diagonal line is, is the axial models, and uh, you see that, that you can actually uh, start to uh, measure things that are awarded that, that, that diagonal line for very small mass of axion, for the, i.e. for axion coupling constant, which are greater than 10 to 15 GV. Now, there, this is, these are extraordinary challenging experiments, but maybe those are the right, the right nothing to, to look for. There is a, another suggestion by uh, Pierre Sikivi and friends, which basically, again, are using the fact that axions in a magnetic field will produce an, a, another magnetic field. And uh, Sikivi and friends thinks that you can enhance this, this effect by looking at, 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 at this produced magnetic field in, in a, uh, by using an LC circuit. And again, uh, they think that these proposed experiments have a sensitivity. They will look for very super light, uh, super light actions, i.e. they will cover more of a parameter space. So let me conclude, because this is, a, this is, this, this is I think, would have made uh, Stuart very happy. Uh, we are entering an era where the people are looking for nothing with a vengeance. And uh, my sense is that in the next 10 years, we will finally answer the question. There will be almost 50 years after we ask the question, do actions exist? The experiments are very fancy, but very interesting. Uh, they're using essentially all the tools that we have. Uh, and this prospect, I think, would have pleased Stuart enormously. Just to other experiments to look for very tiny signals that perhaps could tell us something over the universe. Anyway, uh, my friendship with Stuart was wonderful. Uh, he made me understand that experimentalists actually do useful things. Uh, we actually never argued very much. I think he was intimidated by, by, by the fact that I, I could scream louder than he. <laughs> But anyway, it's a pleasure to be here to give, to give this talk. Thank you.